morning in Jesus' name. Blessing to be together in the house of God. Worshiping our Lord, our Maker, our Redeemer. Been blessed with the services thus far, the devotional and also the Sunday school. And as I thought of a message for this morning, let's turn to Revelation 1, reading verses 3 through 8. Revelation chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep these sayings which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Trust that's why we're here this morning. Blessed is he that readeth and those that hear the words of this prophecy. You think, oh, he's going to go into Revelations. He's going to expound on Revelations this morning. That's not what I have in mind. There's one verse here in Revelation. I know we often tend to think that Revelations is a hard to understand portion of the word. And, and I agree, it is. It is harder to understand. But I believe, blessed is he that still readeth, and blessed is he that heareth, and those that love the word of God in its entirety. You know, there's many people today who read the word of God, but not in its entirety. There's many today that read the word of God, but do not want to do all of the will of God. God is calling for us as his people to read the word of God and to hear the words of the prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. You know, that's where the rubber meets the road, we say. Keeping the word of God. God is desirous that each one of us keeps his word. It is the very word that you and I will be judged by at the end of our lives. By this word, we will either be justified or condemned before God. So why should we not be blessed to read, to understand, and to keep the word of God? Going on in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you, and peace from he which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him, Jesus, that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Pausing there. John speaking here to the seven churches which were in Asia. And he says, Grace, peace be to you from he which is, which was, and is to come. Who is that? I believe. It is Jesus. And it goes on, and from Jesus. And then it was like, well, is that, was he speaking of God? Well, they are three in one. It's definitely speaking of the Godhead. And going on there, he has washed us from our sins. Notice that, from our sins, not in our sins. He has washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth will wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Here again we see that phrase, which was, which is, and is to come. Our God is alive today. Our God is on the throne, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is reigning today. He was reigning yesterday. He was reigning 2,000 years ago. And he will reign forever and ever. We serve Almighty God. Now how? This King of kings, Lord of lords we call him. He is omnipotent, almighty, all-powerful. And we are dust of the earth, but we are his creation. What mystified me in this scripture is the simple fact where it says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. How is that? Are you a king or a queen this morning? 
Do we say, well, I'm a king or I'm a priest? Look at me. What is he saying here? John the Revelator giving us from the vision that he saw that Jesus, the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God. I know this morning, and I'll, I'll just be honest, what really got me started on this, I happen to think about the simple statement, hath made us kings and priests. That that phrase came into my mind. You know when it came to my mind? When we had two king daughters living in our house for a couple days. Here they were. And I was like, wow, we've got the kings in our house. I guess they were queens. But it made me think of this scripture. I guess Ivan can easily say I'm a king. For me, that's a little difficult to think that I can call myself a king. Why would I want to? Why should I? Well, let's digest it a little bit. Most commentaries say that this was a misprint. That collectively they are a kingdom of priests. Well, I can see the formation of that. I can see the, the reasoning behind that that we don't call ourselves kings because that, that's kind of proud. That's arrogant that we call ourselves kings because ultimately God is king of kings. But notice that we use that term over and over. He is what? King of kings and Lord of lords, ruling and reigning over everything. Okay, so if he is king of kings, who are the kings? We say, oh, Trump. Many others that we could put names in. Is that what he's saying? Having justified and sanctified them, he makes them, or us, kings to his father that is in his father's account with his approval and for his glory so how can we as Christians be as kings what's the parallel what can we take out of it for New Testament era Christians as kings govern their own spirits Conquer Satan. Have power and prevalence with God in prayer. And shall judge the world. That's Christians. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12 it says. If we suffer. We shall also reign with him. Revelation 2.26 he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. God's people as kings. This special appointment of being kings does not protect us from difficult battles and opposition, but it protects us from defeat. Many kings in the Old Testament, as we think of God's people in the Old Testament as, as armies and as a kingdom and as kings leading forth the armies, they went to battle many a time. Were they without opposition? Were they without conflict? No. The church of Jesus Christ is militant. The church of Jesus Christ has a battle to win. The church of Christ will face obstacles. It will face hardships. But God is looking for kings and queens, if you will, this morning to lead out and to win the battles as Satan opposes the church of Jesus Christ. 
he also hath made us priests. Given them access to God, enable them to enter to the holiest and to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifices, and has given them an unction suitable to this character and for these high honors and favors, they are bound to ascribe him and to him dominion and glory forever. The priestly side of it is more not so much in the conquering and in, in the uh, leading out and to, to win the battles, but the priest is more in the line of worship. The priest is to, to bring forth sacrifices acceptable to God. So this morning, as we look into this, kings and priests unto God our Father. As I studied, I was going to do the whole message in one, but I soon saw that I will split it up again. We will be looking only at the king's side this morning. And Lord willing, on the next message, we will have on the priests. So we want to focus today upon us as God's people being a king unto our God. Being a king. In 1 Peter 2 verse 9 it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a what? A royal priesthood. Royal. That means kingly. That means with, with dignity and with, with a, how would you say, a king has something to fight for. A king is with royal decree, has, has a kingdom that he is, he is zealously affected for. And that is how we as kings are zealously affected for the kingdom of God. We love our kingdom, the ones that we are kings over. And we love to do whatever it takes for the benefit of the kingdom. So we are a royal priesthood that offers sacrifices and praise and honor and glory to our king of kings and lord of lords. We recognize that the kingship is not ours alone. We are in a battle together, you might say, and it, it, it it's a little hard for me. I'd rather be preaching about, about we as servants or soldiers in the army. That seems a little more fitting. But as I thought of this, this concept, how can we be kings? I believe kings will fight together as an army as well. I think kings will be soldiers fighting the battles. We recognize that we are not king of kings. We are not lord of lords. But we are a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises here's the priesthood of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light so I asked a question can you think of anyone in the Bible that was a king and a priest Anyone? There was one person. Raymond, you're shaking your head. Yes. Yeah, King of Salem. What was his name? Yes, Melchizedek. King of Salem. He was, well, let's read it. Genesis 14, verses 17 through 20 says, And the king of Sodom, this was when Abraham went to deliver Lot from, he, Lot was taken captive by this, uh, I don't hardly know how to pronounce it, Chedorlaomer, uh, a king. And he was taken captive, and Abraham went to deliver him. And after he, he got Lot and his family and his belongings back, he was coming back towards Sodom. And the king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and of the kings that were with him at the valley of Sheva, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Notice, Melchizedek, king of Salem, was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand. And he gave him tithes of all. So, who was Melchizedek's parents? Nobody knows. When did Melchizedek die? Nobody knows. Interesting character. 
I'd like to know more about Melchizedek. I tried to, to study and to, to and, and there's so many theories out there, but none of them's based on the word. So he was, but he isn't. I believe he was a type of Christ. So, he was king of Salem. Where was Salem? Not talking about Indiana or Missouri. Anybody know where Salem was? Well, who can tell me what, Mount, what happened on Mount Moriah? Mount Moriah. Where Isaac was offered. Anybody know about the city of, and I'm not sure how to pronounce it, it's spelled J-E-B-U-S, Jabus. This morning in Sunday school, we had about the Jebusites. They were from the city of Jabus, the Jebusites. Anybody know where that was? Nobody? All right. The threshing floor of Ornan. Where was that? Wasn't that where the angel of God was stayed when David had numbered the armies and, and God was punishing David for his faithlessness in him? And, for, and David said, oh Lord, he said, what, what have these done? That was me. And at that point, God stayed the angel. That was at Mount Moriah. That was at the threshing floor of Arnon. And that was at Jabus. Also, Salem was also at this very same place after there was a, and I read this, and I, I forget now who the king was at the time that, that took over the town of Jabus and named it Salem. And that is where Melchizedek then was king over Salem. And as time went on, that became Jerusalem, which today is the Temple Mount. All the same place. So it was interesting to me to think of this special designated place that was, you might say, the center point of God's kingdom in the Old Testament era is where this Melchizedek was king. So he was a king and a priest, the only one we can read about. So this morning as I think of a king, how do we relate to being a king as God's people is the thrust of the message this morning. I'd like to make an acrostic. king. What is a king's job? What does a king do as a king? When we think of the letter K, he is responsible to kill the enemy. Kings were responsible to kill the enemy. 1 Samuel 17, 44 says, And the Philistines said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh into the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come unto thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And we know the story how that David triumphed over Goliath. Now, you say, well, David wasn't king yet. He was already anointed 
king, but he was not acting king at this point. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling, with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof, and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, what? Says they fled. Notice here that the whole kingdom of Israel was delivered from the bondage of the enemy by one faithful king doing his part. He wasn't even on the throne, and yet he was a king. And I had to liken that to us today. You know, we are to be a king of the kingdom of God, a kings and priests. And as we are a king, we desire to do our part in killing the enemy. Each one of us in the church of Jesus Christ, whether you're a king or a queen, if you will, we are responsible to kill the enemy. We are in a warfare. The enemy is seeking to come in and to destroy. And there's many different avenues that the king, that Satan comes at us to try and defeat us and to destroy us. But we must be victorious. We must fight the battle. We must kill the enemy, not do as Solomon did in our Sunday school. How he just might say uh, babysat or nursed his, his evil influences and kept them close. And it says that the hearts of these women deceived him and, and, and his latter end was not so good because he did not put away evil. We are called to put away evil. We cannot harbor sin, evil imaginations and different things that, that we cannot harbor in our hearts. We must kill the enemy, not play with it and fondle it and to have it around whenever we want to. And 1 Samuel 23 verse 1 says, And they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they robbed the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, Go and smite the Philistines, and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? And David inquired of the Lord again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. The men were not sure. He said, You know, I, I just... I'm afraid. I just don't know that we can do this. But David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, Take it. Take the battle. Go do it. You will conquer. God gives us the power to conquer all enemies. There's no enemy that is greater than God. There's no enemies greater than God. Yes, Satan is, all, is mighty, but God is almighty. All the trials and temptations of this life can be conquered, even death itself. Through the power of God, we can walk through any trial or temptation, conquering and triumphing over all. Victory is ours through God, not self. As kings trusted God, as they put their dependence upon God, they won the battles. But what happened when the kings tried to do it of their own strength? They lost the battles. When David numbered the children of Israel, there was a great loss. Why? Because they were depending on their own strength. We as God's people, as kings of the kingdom of God, can conquer the battles when we rely on God and not self. Luke 10, 19, Jesus said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. It was Jesus that gave the power. It wasn't the 70 that were sent out. It was the power of God. So many times we lose the battle. We lose our battles because we depend on our own strength. Instead of stepping back and saying, God, this is yours. You fight my battles. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't fight earthly battles. We're not out there fighting against Iran or Afghanistan or Russia or China or whatever. We have a spiritual battle. We are not kings of an earthly kingdom. We are kings of a heavenly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. And we fight our battles in the name of God. 
Romans 8, 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. It says, nay, in all these things we are what? It says, more than conquerors through him that loved us. Kings that are conquerors fight their battles and win. Today, we fight our battles in the name of Jesus. And at his name, evil has to go. More than conquerors. Many other verses we could read. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I believe Satan, one of his greatest influences to wreck the kingdom of God is through imaginations and pride and disobedience as we just read here. Those three seem to conquer many kings. Many kings lose out or per se many Christians today lose out in their battles because of evil imaginations and pride and disobedience. Casting down imaginations, thoughts and imaginations that are uncontrolled, evil, lustful, immoral, unjust, wrong, and untrue. We could read in Romans where it speaks that people came vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They received a reprobate mind. In Romans chapter 1, vain in their imaginations. You know, as I thought of kings being defeated, to think that many kings are defeated simply by vain imaginations. In 1 Samuel 18, verse 7 through 9, we read how that envy and jealousy created defeat. It says, The women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands. To me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul, I, David, from that day forward. Here was a king that was out winning battles. But one of his other kings, if you will, was maybe a little bit more victorious than he was. And what did it do? It caused envy and jealousy. It was an evil imagination because he let the facts of the war damage his relationship with his brothers and sisters in Christ through envy and jealousy. Satan doesn't care how he gets us as long as he can get us one way or the other. Envy and jealousy. When others can perform better than I can. When others seem to get more honor and glory than I do. And he eyed David from that day forward. And what happened to the kingdom of Saul? He lost it. He was defeated because he eyed David and he lost the kingship. Also, when we become lax and indifferent and we just don't care about the things of God, we start losing out as well. And Jeremiah 7, 24 says, They hearken not nor incline their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. If we want to go backward in our Christian life, we just become careless. Don't incline our ear to the word of God. Walk in the counsel and the imagination of our own evil heart. Rather than what does God say? What would God want me to do? God has a plan. But we backslide when we allow the evil imaginations of our heart to take us backward. 
2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they received not the love of the truth. Many kings were destroyed. This morning in Sunday school again, referring back to that, Rehoboam did not love the truth. He was instructed by the elderly men of the right way and the good way. But he chose the other. He did not love the truth. Our kingship, our kingdom will be defeated if we don't have a love for the truth. Do I love the truth this morning? Is it precious to me? Do I take time to seek it out? Zechariah 7 verse 10. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears and they should not hear. Imagining evil against each other in our hearts. That should not be named in the kingdom of God. Imagining evil does so horrible things. Oh, we can, we can imagine, you know, things. When we lack the love of God and love for a fellow man, we soon begin to imagine evil. Oh, you see what brother so-and-so did? He, I can just imagine. You know what he's after? Uh-huh. And soon we have a whole concoction of evil intents by our evil imagination. And you know what? It does us more harm than anyone else. We destroy our own relationship with God by evil imaginations toward others. Bitterness is often the root of that. It says, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. You know, we harbor bitterness. It takes down our throne. It takes down our kingdom. It will destroy us. Bitterness will just... It's the, the gall of bitterness to call it. It's, it's a... Well, I often have to think of that as... I know it's a little crude, but... When I have indigestion and I'm burping and belching and it's bitter and... It's kind of like bitterness of... In our hearts. It's bitter and it destroys us. Psalm 36 verse 4. He, or the wicked, deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. And Luke 151 speaks of pride. For God hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Many other verses we could go to. But I'd like to go to the I now. What else does a king do besides conquering and, and gain the victory over the enemy? What else does a king do, a good king? He is an investigator. An investigator. So a king, a good king, is an investigator. We know that in Joshua chapter 2, when they were, children of Israel were gathered there and getting close to Jericho, so there's told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, I came in hither tonight to the children of Israel to search out the country. Why did Joshua want to send people to Jericho to search it out? He was investigating what they were about to face. He wanted to know the, the, the town of Jericho. And he wanted to get up a strategic plan to conquer this city. Yes, I believe he was he was working with God as well. We know that he was because God told him how to, how to conquer them. But he also did his part in investigating. Yes, we trust in God and we, we look to God to fight our battles and for us to gain the victory. But I believe God wants us as kings and queens of God to be an investigator. We don't just blindly accept everything that comes along. We don't just, every time there's a new thing, we say, oh, all right, that must be a better way. And we just adapt to everything that comes around. We investigate. What is this? Is this something that correlates with the word of God? Is it going to stand the test of time? What, what are we accepting? What are we, are we investigating as things come around? Proverbs 25, 2. If the glory of God, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. The honor of kings is to search out a matter. 
You know, a good king is an investigator. He, he wants to know. He wants to be informed. He wants to know. You know, the U.S. has what's called FBI. What does that mean? It's Federal Bureau of Investigations. They are a direct arm of the president. Or you might say a counter. They are part of the justice system, but they, are, they inform the president of dangers. FBI. Not only dangers, but uh, I looked it up. It says a primary, primarily a domestic agency can maintaining 56 field offices in major cities throughout the United States and more than 400 resident agencies in smaller cities and areas across the nation. And does the president care about the FBI? Yes, he does. In the fiscal year of 2019, it cost the federal government $9.6 billion to support the FBI. $9.6 billion just to investigate. The FBI's main goal is to protect and defend the United States. So they are out investigating. They are investigating terrorists, foreign intelligence, cyberspace attacks, corruption at all levels, civil rights, white collar crime, violent crime, and the list goes on. Many different areas, they're not just focused on one thing. They are broad in their investigations. My point is simply that if the government cares so much about investigations, what about us as God's people? Are we investigating? making sure that we are using the unadulterated Word of God. We're not just going by the commentary. We're not just going by Protestant writers. We are going by the Word of God. Are we searching it out? In 1 Corinthians 2, 10 it says, For the Spirit searcheth all things, says, Yea, the deep things of God. <coughs> Searching it out, investigating, yea, the deep things of God. You know, if we want to know the will of God, if we want to know how to fight our battles, if we want to know how to be a good king, we must investigate, we must search it out. First Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walk about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith. We must be vigilant. Investigating, the only way we can overcome and conquer. There's this story of, in uh, this, these people were trying to, to hunt ducks. And I think I've used this illustration before, but I had to think of it again. And as they were trying to hunt these wild ducks, they just, they, they couldn't get close enough to get a shot at them. And so they were trying to come up with how can we get up close to these ducks before they fly away? So they came up with a plan that they took pumpkins and floated them down the river. And first when these pumpkins started coming past the ducks, they flew away. But after a while, they became accustomed to these pumpkins floating down the river. Well, finally, once the ducks were well used to the pumpkins, they would carve out the pumpkins, put them over their head, and go down the river with the, they were still breathing because they were above water, but the pumpkin concealed their head. And they had cutouts for their eyes, and they got ducks. Now, we know that ducks can't be investigators. But how often are we like ducks and become accustomed to things that should alarm us? Are we careful? Are we, do we just trust everything that comes around? Are we just lax and indifferent? Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Many verses, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, continue in prayer and watch. Ye are the children of light, none of the day. Therefore don't sleep as do others, but let's watch and be sober. The FBI has another arm that is specially trained, and they call it the SWAT team. 
They are specially trained to recognize the enemy and how to deal with them. SWAT stands for Special Weapons and Tactics. They are highly trained military units that tackle situations beyond the capability of conventional police forces. SWAT teams are called in when an incident presents significant risk to law enforcement officers or the public. So, I had to think of, are we content to just be FBI's or are we desirous to be a part of the SWAT team? How do we, how do we get that? How do we get more training? I believe it is Ephesians 6, 17, taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is our SWAT, if you will. This is what teaches us how to identify the enemy. This is what teaches us how to conquer the enemy. So let's investigate and to be careful to be alert. Next one, a good king nurtures the good people with care and protection. I'll just put nurtures here. A good king cares about his people. A good king is benevolent and he loves to be a blessing to his subjects. Now in the kingdom of God, we don't call each other subjects. But I believe a good king and a good queen in the kingdom of God loves to nurture and be a blessing to his fellow man. All those are part of our kingdom. Reading about a king in the Old Testament, St. Chronicles 30, 21. Sons and the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites and taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. And the whole assembly took counsel to keep other seven days. After they had this special meeting, they said, oh, we need some more of this. They said, let's have another seven days. And they got together with gladness. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, did give to the congregation a thousand bullocks and 7,000 sheep. The king gave this to the people. That was a lot of meat. A thousand bullocks and 7,000 sheep. 1,700 head that he gave to the people. He didn't say you can come buy them. He gave it to them. This was a benevolent king, and he cared about his people. And what response did he get from the people? It says, with gladness, they were there. And they just said, well, this is so good. Let's have another seven days. So do people like, now, I almost said, do people like us? But do people, are people blessed by my life? Are people blessed and love? Or do they say, oh, glad to, get, glad to get away from Titus. Whew. Or would they say, let's have another seven days. What's the difference? Because of nurture and care for each other. Does, in the natural, thinking again, I... Always had to think of the natural versus the spiritual. Does Trump nurture the people of his country? Well, I think he tries to, to a certain degree. I believe he is a president or king, if you will, that desires to do good for the country. I think he desires that. Now, recently they had a stimulus bill that went through Congress and Trump was pushing for it. And how much money did that consist of? Anyone know? Says that there were 159 million payments constituting of $267 billion. Trump 
Trump was concerned about, well, probably first of all his reelection. But reality is he was giving to those that he felt were in need because of this pandemic. And even now, this very time, Mitch McConnell said his second pill would not exceed one trillion. They are thinking of something bigger and better coming. The CARES Act is a two trillion dollar package and the HEROES Act a three trillion package, dollar package. So there's a one, two, or three trillion dollar package being considered. McConnell says not more than one trillion. Last one was 267 billion. They're all doing this for the sake of their country. How, how much is a trillion? I couldn't wrap my mind around it. So I looked it up and it says a thousand millions is a billion. So a thousand times a million is one billion. And a thousand billions is a trillion. It's mind boggling. But to think how that they are overextending themselves to try and help people. So I asked myself the question, is that the way I feel toward the kingdom of God? I think they are overextending themselves. I don't think they should be doing this. But they are going way overboard in helping others. What about me? What is my testimony in the kingdom of God? Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, it says. Galatians 6, 9, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, it says, let us do good unto all men. It says, especially unto those of the household of faith. Really? Love your enemies and do good and lend. Remind us that we be good and rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Another verse, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. Another one, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. Psalm 34, depart from evil and do good. Psalm 37, trust in the Lord and do good. Luke 10, good Samaritan poured in water and oil, or oil and wine, set him in his own, own beast, brought him to an inn, took care of him. He overextended himself. He did more than he probably would have had to. He was even an enemy. What is my testimony? Do I love to nurture others? Am I benevolent and kind? A child of the king, or I guess in this setting, a king under the king of kings, nurtures those around him. And last but not least, a good king gives his all. When, Dan, when David came back into Jerusalem and he had just brought the ark of God on an ox cart and they were bringing it in. David was so happy and so excited and he was dancing before the Lord and says with all his might. So I asked the question. David was a good king. He was a man after God's own heart and he gave it all he had. It says with all his might he was worshiping God. In the Old Testament pattern so I ask myself the question, do I give God all I've got? Do I give the kingdom all I've got? We know the account in 2 Kings 13 where Elisha was falling sick and Joash the king of Israel came down to speak with him and he wanted some good words and comfort and direction from, from Elisha yet before he died. And Elisha said unto him, Take this bow and arrow and put thy hand upon the bow and open the east window eastward. And he said, shoot, and he shot. He said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, the deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Assyrians. He said, now take those arrows and smite them on the ground. And it says he took them and smoked three times and quit. It was like, okay, 
What's that about? He said, oh, why would you stop with three? He said, you could have gone five, six, or ten times. Thou could have smitten Israel until thou hast consumed them. He didn't give it his all. And he ended up losing to the Syrians. A good king gives his all for kingdom building. Colossians 3.23 Whatsoever ye do, do it hardly as to the Lord and not unto men. Giving our all even when it's not easy to do so. Some people are unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Love them anyway. If you do good, people may accuse you of selfish ulterior motives. Do good anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Honesty makes you vulnerable. Be honest anyway. What you spend years building may be destroyed overnight. Build anyway. People really need help, but may attack you if you, if you need help. Help them anyway. Give the world the best you have, and you may get kicked in the teeth. Give the world the best you have anyway. Let's just make sure that when we are doing what God wants us to do, that we're doing things that edify and build the kingdom and not just for selfish motive and prestige. You know, today many people do difficult things with great risks and much enthusiasm, but there's no reward except for a name. Now some things are worthy, some are not. Charles Lindbergh, he flew across the Atlantic Ocean in 1927 in a single engine plane going less than 100 miles an hour. Now how far is it across the Atlantic? 3,716 miles. If you're doing less than 100, so I figured it at 90 miles an hour, it would take 41 hours of flying until you reach land on the other side. So he was approximately 41 hours flying that little single engine airplane. But he had a name. He did it. How did he eat? How did he sleep? Other questions I, I can't answer. But he made a name. Now there's another one. Name is Ben Lecom Lecomte. Anyone heard of him? I never had. I had heard of Lindbergh. This person chose to swim the same distance that Lindbergh flew. And he arrived in northwest France at 3.30 p.m. on Friday afternoon, exhausted after a 73-day journey. So I went and tried to find out more about this great swimmer only to find out that he had a sailboat going with him and it is very very controversial that he actually did it because they say that the time since there is no standard definition of swimming across the Atlantic there is uncertainty about distance that La Camante actually covered swimming in the water rather than riding in a boat with the prevailing currents According to the Rocky Mountain News, Locomonte would have had to average eight miles an hour to have swum the entire distance three to four times as fast as any other long distance swimmer ever swam. So they're saying it, he relied more on the boat than he swam. What good did it do? He wanted a name. When we, as kings in the kingdom of God, desire a name, we will be doing things to try and look great that has no lasting benefit. So God help us that we can be humble kings, humble queens if you will, and that we would not be seeking to be recognized or for prestige, but that we can do all we can for the building of the kingdom of God. 
that we as, as a king kill the enemy, investigate for a, uh, you might say, to know the right from the wrong, and to chart a straight course and a good course, to nurture those around us, and give the kingship, the kingdom building, all we've got, that God can be glorified. Shall we kneel for a word of prayer? Dear Lord, as we bow in your presence at this moment, thank you.